Yeah, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to this, the second in the Survive, Pivot, Adapt, Thrive webinar series from Daffins. This is presented to you as part of Daffins Business Leader Group, which is something we've been running for probably about the last five years now. And Daffins Business Leader Groups is more than just webinars. Originally, it started off as a support group for business leaders in the local community and formed quite a tight-knit group of four members who were originally meeting on a quarterly basis face-to-face. -face. But alongside the quarterly face-to-face uh, -face meetings, they were having one-to-one -one advisory support online. Face-to-face -face training came through on a quarterly basis. There was a huge opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer networking. And in the background, we've got this fantastic platform, which is called MindShop Online, which is available 24 seven for access to either Richard or myself as your coach. And there's lots of online training, lots of resources there to help you fix the key issues um, that are in your business. But just flipping back a slide then. So but then the coronavirus crisis hit and we've had to move away from having the face to face quarterly sessions. So in May and June, we've had these two uh, Thrive, Pivot, Adapt webinars, which is just a bite sized chunk of what Daffer's Business Leader Groups is all about. But I'll be telling you more about uh, business leader groups and uh, how it may be evolving as we start to return to normal at the end of the session today. Um, and hopefully things will start to return to normal in a couple of months. So that's what Daffin's business leader groups is all about. As I say, this webinar is really just scratching the surface of what we do. The real value is to be had between the sessions and the interaction with us as, as your coach. So today's agenda, we're gonna have a quick look at some of the new releases on the MindShop online platform. Richard is then going to talk us through the next phase of the, the roadmap to recovery. And then we're gonna try and um, open the discussion asking your thoughts and opinions on, um, on how your businesses are, uh, are coping with the crisis. Um, Richard's then gonna go into two more aspects of pivoting and adapting your business and some of the things you can be looking at. And then we're gonna bring it together with an action point list and summarizing where we've got to, and then wrapping up in about 55 minutes time at about half past one. And moving forward then to uh, the new releases on the MindShop Online platform. Now the, the MindShop Online platform has been uh, around for about the last five years. It's evolving and improving really on a, on a monthly basis. And there's new tools and courses and resources that are being added all the time. One of the newest resources that we've got is very apt considering the subject matter for today, but it's a pivot adapt online course. Um, it, it's gonna take you somewhere between three and eight hours to work through it. It's guided at each, at each stage. So if you'd like access to this particular course, if you're not currently a MindShop Online member with Daffins, or a business leader group member, then we can we can talk to you later about signing you up so that you can have a look at this course for yourself. We've had um, we've had a, some big success over the last uh, the last month six weeks with the online courses on MindShop Online because they had a, an offer where it was free registration on any course up to the end of May. That particular offer is now closed, but there was um, a course on personal resilience, which has had a huge take up. I know internally within Daffins, Richard, I think we've got about 12 people within the team, but I know externally you've got quite a few as well, haven't you? Yeah, yes, indeed. We've had a lot of people and uh, I had quite a rush because, because 31st of May was, was, was Sunday and the, the uh, deadline was five o'clock. I had a number of people that were emailing me and texting me about uh, mid-afternoon on Sunday, so where they are now all enrolled and registered. So they've got, now got six months to do, to do those courses. But just to, just to stress, there are, I think there's getting on for 20 of these courses on there. The, the Pivot Adapt course is one of the newer ones along with the Resilience course. But if you're a Daffins Business Leader Group member, then all these courses are included and, and are free. Some of the other tools that we've got available that we're using with clients, um, I think competitor analysis is something you may be touching on later, Richard. Indeed. Um, but something which is really good in terms of trying to work out what your business is good at and where you sit in the marketplace is a tool called Product Portfolio Analysis. There's, a, there's full guidance on how you can run that tool on your business to analyze things. The, the one-page business plan is something that we've been using for a long, long time. And there's lots of stuff on the Daffins website. There's the Killer Coffee video, which is really just another version of the, the one-page business plan. One of my favorite tools is Strategic SWOT, uh, which is more than the old strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, really useful to drill into particular issues within 
a business or even as part of an appraisal process with a member of staff. And there's actually a video on the Daphne's YouTube channel that I did about a year or so ago, uh, running you all the way through strate strategic SWOS. One of your favourites, which I think you may be touching on as well later on, Richard, product surround. Yes, indeed. Trailed, trailed last time. So uh, yes, trailed we're going to do, do a full session on product surround. Okay, so moving on from that. So this is the point where I hand over to Richard. Um, so Richard Miller, who I forgot, forgot to introduce last time, you forgot to introduce me at the start, and this time I've returned the favour and not introduced you. So, so thanks very much indeed. As, as Martin mentioned, um, uh, this is the second in the series of, of, of the webinar on uh, survive, pivot, adapt, and thrive. And one of the things we focused on last time around, and Martin introduced to you, was the idea of this 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 one-page roadmap. So what I want to try and do is is build upon that and also see what happened in the last 30 days since the last webinar. One of the advantages of the, of, of the regular business leader groups, it isn't just a, a, a learning session, but it's a, a regular chance for those attendees uh, to, to check in with each other. And it provides a context in terms of how what progress is being made and also an opportunity to get feedback from others. You will have received a copy of this um, online beforehand. Uh, if you don't have a copy, we're gonna be sending out one after um, the, uh, uh, the webinar today. And effectively what it is, it, it, it is a roadmap and the, 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 the emphasis there is on actually, on actually navigating through the crisis. And if you're navigating, the, the idea is you're not just reacting to something, that you are taking a, a, an active role in terms of determining where your destination is and if you're going to navigate you need to work out where you are so therefore what are the steps that you need to follow to actually get you to to to, to the point in time over the horizon when the business is going to be back and hopefully thriving perhaps with a with an amended business model the the, the actual roadmap itself uh, breaks down into sort of a two two areas in where we can sort of slice and dice it down the left hand side as it was, as we discussed last time is is that the kind of um actions that you should be taking depending upon the severity of the actual uh, impact of the crisis on your business uh, and so we've got some scenarios uh, where you know and i've got this with with with, with quite a few clients actually is that they they're relatively unaffected if anything they may have seen increased demand so the, the first section here is busy so busy but demand may even be an increasing and then we have those in the next section, which is low impact, so 10 to 20% reduction in revenue, uncertainty, and there's some short-term impact. But we're hoping that as restrictions ease, that it's going to be one of those sort of V uh, recessions rather than a U recession, effectively, that means we'll be able to bounce back. And the last one is high impact. And there are a number of businesses that I've been talking to, particularly on a lot of not-for-profits over the last um, 10 weeks or so. Um, where they have been badly affected by the uh, um, by the actual crisis itself, and they've had to uh, uh, take a lot of a long hard look to first of all say you know can we survive as an organisation, uh, and secondly if we can survive how is the model going to uh, adapt when we come out? The other areas, the phases we, we we're going to move through. When we talked last time round about the first the first phase was survive, you know batten down the hatches, making sure you've got a business that can can evolve from the other side. Um, and so uh, a lot of focus in the early first three or four weeks of the crisis was, was to do with liquidity, funding, bounce back loans, furloughing. We're finding with most businesses now, they're actually moving away from that and they're starting to sort of lift their eyes to and beyond the horizon. And we're looking at the pivot and adapt phase. Now, the, the key thing I want to mention here is that, that, that the pivot and adapt is you, you need to actively do something here. It isn't just a question of reacting to circumstances. So if you see on the roadmap under pivot adapt, it says, what do you need to do? Well, you need to explore innovations. You need to pivot strategies. It could be we need to adapt the delivery or our business model. And we need to develop new products or services for an evolved marketplace. You ought to be actively working with your team. And I know a lot of businesses have, have, have in the crisis have created a sort of core leadership group that is meeting on a regular basis, uh, the sort of equivalent of COBRA. Uh, and they are actually driving this assessment of how the organization needs to pivot and adapt. And the idea being is then that you're on the front, front foot so that when we do come to thrive, the business is in, in, in the right place to actually start to, to move out of, uh, uh, of the actual uh, pivot and adapt phase to be able to thrive and generate further income streams. So in terms of where we're at, last time around, we were finding that quite a lot of businesses have still had their sort of toes stuck in the survive phase. Uh, general rule of thumb, I think we're finding at the moment that most people, are, there are still some people uh, with furloughing and there may be some redundancies going through on the survival phase. But a lot of it we're finding are people are moving into this pivot adapt stage. And so that's where I want to focus our efforts in terms of the discussion. I think one of the key things here, it isn't just, it's an ongoing process. It, it isn't just a question of we'll decide to adapt and that's it. 
what we're finding with businesses is that, that they're actually going to pivot and adapt and repeat this process. Perhaps we're, to, we're thinking probably over the next three to six months. Um, and I'll come on a little bit later to talk, talk about a, a process that you can follow, which allows you to assess that and how effective you're going to be. In overall terms, as I said, we need to be on the, the, uh, the, the, front, the front foot so that as and when the, 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 uh, the uh, scenario allows you to actually open up, you're able to power out rather than reacting to change and st being slow in the output. And that's partly because you don't want your competitors to take a, a, a lead upon you. But you also want to be able to make sure that you are in a position where you're generating income again at an earliest possible stage to actually drive the funding of the organization. So that's a brief revisit of the, the roadmap. What I'd like to do is, is, is at this particular point in time, open out to, to any kind of discussion. And what we can do is if, if, the, if you can, the, you'll have a Q&A uh, um, uh, section on the bottom of your screen and also you'll have a, a chat section. So if there, it, what we're looking to do is try and get some feedback since last time around as to, you know, how are you dealing with the crisis? And if you've started to pivot and adapt, how is that process going? How successful are you? So this is, this is, this is a client, uh, it's an active client of mine. Uh, and after the last um, webinar, when we talked about the need to start pivoting, adapting, they were doing a strategic planning session. So these are actual photos of what was stuck around their wall. So they were basically developing these ideas. So I'll just take you through these to a certain extent. So the first scene setter they used with the core team was the quote from Darwin and we had last time. Oops, bear me a second. Um, so it's not the strongest of the species that survives nor the most intelligent, it's the one that is adaptable to change. So they started that as part of the process of actually getting off the ground. And then they basically talked through with the management team as to the three phases they needed to go through. So where were they on the survive phase? What did they need to start thinking about from a strategic planning point of view in terms of pivot and adapt to allow them to come out to the thrive? And this is what they started talking about. Bear me a second. So the questions they were assessing. So the first one was what was going to happen in terms of social distancing and home working? They're a business that uses quite a lot of manufacturing processes, but they actually found that, that uh, when they were doing home working, then in some respects, they got far more efficient than everybody being on site. Somehow it seemed to click into place as to the systems and processes working without intervention from the management on a day-to-day -day basis. They were also looking at travel, you know, what's going to be the impact in terms of them being able to travel around, impact upon the oil price, was it going to be a worldwide recession? Um, business failures, they, they are very much geared at the moment, they, their, their money, their revenue streams come from uh, defence, aerospace and medical, uh, with most of it come from the aerospace side. And so a lot of their pivot and adapt was on the basis of what's going to happen to our aerospace clients and what can we do to, to secure those contracts moving forward in terms of our, of our adaptation of how we interact with those customers. But also probably more importantly, how do we pivot to drive an income stream more into the medical side? Um, and then they were looking at in terms of impact upon uh, recruitment and unemployment. And so um, this effectively was the, was the room after the session. And so what they'd done is they'd, they'd worked out each of the, uh, the ideas. Now, the key thing from this is that, yeah, you can have ideas. John Doerr, from Google says, you know, ideas are precious, but they're relatively easy. We've all had ideas. It all comes down to how do you then take the ideas from that strategic, strategic planning session? All of those things where they've identified a need to pivot and adapt, how do you actually then execute that? And Martin mentioned the sort of one page plan and it's all to do with priorities. So of all the ideas generated, you effectively say to yourself, either on a Pareto basis or on a, or on a, on a, or a ranking basis on the basis of impact, you say to yourself, let's pick two or three of those that we can be working on and you know let's fix a deadline as to when we're going to get that done by and who's going to do it so that effectively you're building in an accountability loop and a way of testing it so that's just an example of a, a client who attended last time around i sent them a copy of the video there was a, a strategic planning session in place and they've actually used the framework uh, for pivoting adapting so you know i can i, I can talk about it a, a, a lot but there's just a, a, you know, a real life example of how people have taken the ideas and actually making it work for their business uh, in this phase.
So, Martin, I don't know whether you've been yeah, looking at the well, sort of uh, the Q and A while we've been. Uh... I have. I'm, I'm going to take a bit of a cheeky flyer here. One of the delegates we've got is uh, a client of ours, Ian Jamie, um, yeah. and um, Ian's business, Stega Clear Packaging, is is probably one of the um, the leading examples of a business that has managed to pivot its business model. Um, Ian, I, I'm going to take a flyer. Are you um, are you okay to just yeah. give us a little? Yeah. 30 second overview of what of what you've managed to do at Stega. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, we're a plastic packaging company. Historically, we made packaging for the supermarkets, food mainly, toiletries for L'Oreal and people like that. And as we know, last year, plastic was not flavor of the month. So uh, our uh, turnover was steadily decreasing. And, uh, and I suppose I was on the lookout for any opportunity that may come along. And sadly, of course, COVID in a sense, has been an opportunity for us because uh, one of my colleagues in the Czech Republic sent over a visor and said, oh, why don't you make these in? And so I said, oh, that's a jolly good idea. And so um, we caught it at the beginning. So uh, we've kept our factory incredibly busy from whenever February time. And I'm hoping today, stroke tomorrow, to hear from the National Health Service because I've pestered the politicians like mad <laughs> and anybody I could get my hands on that might help me uh, to bring this kind of production back to the UK from China. I'm hoping to hear that we've got uh, a contract for a million or two million a week for the next six to nine months, which should transform our business. So uh, that's where we are. I mean, the interesting thing on that, on that, Ian, if I can just come in, in terms of how quickly you've been able to actually get a new product off the line. Now, is that something you, you, you normally have the Agile framework to do, or, or is it something that you've adapted because you need to in, in the actual crisis? Well, our machinery, uh, the current machinery are producing these visors, so it's pretty easy for us to do. I mean, our initial prototypes uh, weren't particularly great. I mean, we had German designers and Czech designers and Turkish designers designing various um, things. I had to decide what we were going to go with, but uh, with my sales director. Uh, but we've designed our own, uh, having, having spoken to the consultants at the hospitals a lot, we've designed our own visor, which seems to suit them better. So, and you know, we are cheaper than the Chinese production because they are much fancier than ours, but ours does, does the job. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's evolved. It, you know, we started from a pretty basic start, uh, whereas it was totally out of control, the procurement for the National Health Service. In fact, there was no centralized procurement. So, the trust were buying for themselves and they weren't particularly fussy about what they bought. Uh, but now it's all been brought back to, to, to be a centralized function down in London. And of course I had that C marking, I've had to pass EN17, whatever it is. Uh, and so I've had to go through the regulations to put myself forward on the roster for the national health contract. And that's a classic, classic, classic way of actually sort of uh, opportunities coming out of, of, of what is a crisis opportunities for change and opportunities for new markets it's it's a great it's a great story and um stager have had a lot of uh, very very positive pr from it um the um the, the other one again taking a cheeky flyer we've we've got um jonathan Wilby with us from Van hatton button um and um jonathan you're uh, working with richard as one of the business leader group members um and another professional service firm like daffens um, are you in a position to give us a mini overview of how, how you, you guys are having to adapt? Yeah, what we've been doing is we've been establishing um, sort of team leaderships to look at our different departments, our different sections, um, and to identify where there could be opportunities. And really those opportunities arise from what the client base in those sectors are doing. So it was really good hearing um, that uh, positive contribution from Ian there, that's absolutely fantastic to hear about things like that. I was actually, Martin, just posting a question to Ian. I've just but, seen it, um, yeah. Because yeah. uh, <laughs> I, I was interested to know what, what, what he's doing now about um, his, uh, his core business products and whether um, the new ranges are replacing those, and if so, how long that might uh, might continue to be the case. I've just um, muted Ian, so um, um, Ian, are you still there? Yeah, no, I'm here. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's a very good question. We're not sure about because our, our normal packaging has ground to a halt. We're still doing a bit, 
Um, but what, what will happen in the future, I don't know. This is why, you know, for, to grow the business, I want, I've told the government I want to become a, a PPE supplier into, well into the future, and we're prepared to invest to do so. So we're a bit unsure about our old core business. I mean, I know they are gradually coming back to work and we're picking up orders, but we, we've had a difficult time over the last year, whereas because we make plastic packaging and all the single use problems and environmental stories, it's, you know, we've made a profit as Martin knows, but it's not where we were three or four years ago. So I'm hoping this will really transform our business, if that answers your question. Good stuff. Well, thank you, thank you, guys. Um, so, Richard, back back to you then. Yes, um, yes. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to sort of to dip in and, and get some feedback um, um, later on as well. But I think if I if I take you back to to another main feature of what we have within the business leader groups, and that's an element of sharing, I suppose, thought leadership and and uh, skills that people might want to adapt. And as I've said uh, previously, some of these things might resonate, and you say, "Yeah, I get that," and I could I can see how it's it, 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 we can use it. Others may not but these are just a couple that that I thought I'd sort of focus on uh, firstly because they're things that I that I come across quite a lot on on a daily basis with clients that I'm coaching um, but also because they're a couple of the modules from the uh, uh, from the pivot and adapt course um, so if you're a, if you're a mind shop online user you've got a bit of a preview if you're not a mind shop online online user there's a there is a trailer for the main presentation in that respect so uh, so um, so what, what I'm looking for then is if you're in this pivot and adapt stage, and, and, and Ian mentioned that to a certain extent, is where are there opportunities for you to pivot and adapt? And I'm going to cover two things here that I'd like you to think about. is not only the business itself and its customers and the way that you actually deliver to those customers, but also how is your, how is your role going to change as we uh, emerge and what's going to be the structure of the organization? So Pivot and Adapt has been around for ages. It's like one of those things that the word probably existed, but, but, uh, but only very few people actually uh, mentioned it. Um, there's a really good book here from a chap called Eric Rees, uh, highly recommend it, um, called The Lean Startup. And uh, often when I recommend it as reading to people, they say, well, I'm not, I'm not a startup. And they, they're missing the point there. What The Lean Startup does, does is saying that if you're a startup or if you're an entrepreneur, your main goal is to, is to actually build a sustainable business model. And it could be that over a number of years, we within our organizations have built a sustainable business model. The problem is now is it as a, as a result of COVID-19, we may not be able to go back to that business model. So it's a question as to, we might be trying out new particular models to generate income or a different way of actually delivering our existing products and service. And so um, what, what Eric Rees says in, in, in the Lean Startup is that you cannot just start with a, with, a, with a great plan that says, we start at A, we finish at Z, and everything's going to come, uh, and we're going to have a fantastic business at the end of it. What he's saying effectively is that there's a lot of uncertainty there. And so what you need to do is you need to adopt a process of what he calls validated learning. And the, the, um, the, it's what he calls the sort of build, measure, learn loop. It's very empirical and scientific in its process. So you start with an idea. And so it, it, it might be in Ian's case that, he, that the idea was, you know, we have the technology. Let's see whether there's, there's, we can produce a, a, a plast, you know, plastic PP equipment. So an idea is great. But the problem is, is the idea will only ever be perfect at that point where you have no income stream and you haven't tested it in the marketplace. It's what Eric Reese calls the audacity of zero. In other words, when you've created your business plan, it's all zinging and we've got loads of income stream. It's only when that hits reality, when you try it out, that you really do start learning. So he says, you know, come up with the idea, have, an, have a hypothesis, and then what you need to do is, is build what he calls a minimum viable product. Get something to market quickly to see whether it's what the marketplace wants. So from methodology coming in again, Richard. Um, it is indeed. It is indeed. And the idea is, is that, you know, you experiment and then you get to a point where you, you have two options. You either persevere. So, yes, it's working. There's demand. It's showing uh, uh, value to our customers and there is an opportunity for us to grow this. And so if that's the case, persevere. If not, the idea then is you, if you pivot and the pivot might be change of market as we were talking about with the with the strategy client I had you know do we yes we've been successful in one market do we change the market is it to do with what our core values are you know do our core values need to reflect 
the change circumstances of our clients moving forward. And it could be that effectively we're just talking about a different delivery model. So it's a really good book, but it's, so if you're thinking where the hell does Pivot come from, um, I recommend that as a read and say what we're saying is that, that we have a, a time frame now where as organizations we need to be looking at strategic planning with the ability to adapt and the ability to pivot. So um, as Martin sort of mentioned earlier, a couple of things that I think would be worthwhile just talking through. Um, the first one is a tool that we use on a regular basis. It's in the Mindshop Online platform. It's also one of the modules in the Pivot Adapt course. Uh, and this is an example that we, we're just using an example here of a small residential builder. And it's what we call competitor analysis. And this, this is a tool that people should be doing competitor analysis on a regular basis. It doesn't need COVID-19 crisis to force us into this. But I think what it does, it actually sharpens our focus to say that, you know, we may know, we may have known in the past where we stood alongside our competitors. Um, but perhaps we need to revisit this now to ensure that when we are going to be powering out and thriving on the other side, that we're on the front foot and we know exactly how we, we need to adapt our model. So if I just talk you through the template we have here and you'll have been emailed by Sophie in advance, uh, a copy of this. So if you want to take it with your team afterwards and, and play around, you can do that. But the first thing you need to do is, is, is first of all, uh, put yourself in the minds of, a, of, a, of a, an actual customer or a potential customer. And you need to say, what are the factors that would influence or would be critical in a customer or potential client um, using our service or those of our competitors. And so these are the factors that we put down the left-hand side. We've got four here. I would say normally maximum about eight. Normally most people have about five. And so the first thing you do is you write down the factors. And so in this, in this example we, we're using, we're saying the factors we've identified are people will buy on the basis of value for money, um, quality of design and build, brand and reputation, however you define brand and reputation, and then the, the question of delivery, the fact that on-time delivery might be uh, uh, an important factor. So having identified the factors, the next thing we do is we say, not all of those are gonna be equal. Some of those will, will, will have a greater influence in the decision that a customer makes as to whether they come to us or whether they go to our competitor. So in this case, what we do is we, 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 use, we use weighting out of 100, so if we say that, that all of the factors add up to 100%, you know, what is the weight that we give to the individual components? So in this case, we've seen that actually the most important thing is going to be value for money. So we've scored that 30 out of 100. And then following close behind that, both on the same score is quality design and build and then brand reputation. So the first thing we then do, once we've done that, we, we then effectively say, okay, we want to benchmark ourselves against our competitors. And so the first thing we do is actually we score ourselves at 50. So we take 50%, we take half of the marks uh, as, as, uh, of those weighting. Now, this is where people get confused and they say, well, you know, surely we're better than 50 out of 100. It's got nothing to do with absolute scores. It is setting a benchmark. And the reason we set ourselves at 50 is we then go and we have a look at each of the factors. And we then say for each competitor that we identify, so for, say, for example, value for money, if we're a 15, competitor A, are they better or worse than us? And you do this normally within a group uh, and you know, get the feeling for the group as to, uh, as, to, uh, as to where it goes. It's also good at getting feedback from the people that are the coalface, not the people necessarily in the ivory towers within the senior man management team. So, and you go and score that. So we can say that competitor B on value for money is about the same as us, um, but it's competitors C and D that are that are better than us at value for money. And so by what we tend to do is we work along each line of factor scoring those, and it comes to a relative score. So it basically says that if we're 50, you know, our main competitor who we perceive is better than us is um, by, a, a, by a, a point score of 15 marks is competitor D. But we've also identified those areas where they are uh, stronger or weaker. Now, you don't leave it there. The idea is now you can start doing some reverse engineering. And you say to yourself, well, if we want to try, or as we come out of the crisis, we want to try and, um, we want to try and uh, uh, exceed or make sure we win business off those competitors, what are the actions that we can take? So, uh, for example, um, if we look at this, so these are just some examples that we've come up with. So value for money, what are we going to do? So there may be some actions we're going to take in terms of you know, special offers, or if people are, 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 are worried in terms of the liquidity, we might have some delayed payment options. Um, on the 
quality and uh, design side, you know, what we may be saying if we're a small house builder is that we, we've got, we're going to be, be innovative in terms of what impact on design within the house may be driven by COVID-19. You know, if we have more home working, more people exercising within the home environment. So it could be that we, we adapt our, our designs to do that. So innovation. Brand and reputation. Um, so it could be, we might have more case studies. I mean, the example here talks about adapting to client needs during COVID, but it could be that, that from a general point of view, we often talk to people and say, you need to build proof of capability. Um, it's not enough known that you're good enough. It's a question of how can you actually demonstrate, um, say, testimonials, case studies, videos, all that kind of stuff. It builds that proof of capability before someone actually then does choose to put you down on the tender or approach you to do work. And then the on-time delivery. Um, so the, 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 the example we're using there effectively said that what we might have a look is, is you know, COVID safe working practices for the entire team. So it's a really, really good tool to use this, the competitor analysis tool. Um, and that, one of the other factors you might need to take into account is that we might have thought that these are the important factors. You know, that's how it's always been. But it could be that, that the impact of COVID-19 might have changed the customer's idea as to what is going to be important. Uh, in dealing us with us as a customer. So if you're going to be, oh, I started chatting to a, to, to a guy this morning and he was saying, you know, we built our business up over 10, 15, 20 years and suddenly within three months, I've lost 20% of my income. You know, how am I going to get that back up? You know, you need to do something now and you need to be adaptable to actually drive that income stream again. And if you're lucky, it might be from your, your existing business model with a few adaptations. It might be though there is an opportunity to actually build a new model or pivot it and adapt it to actually mean that you actually get a, a greater income stream from a different source. So that's competitive analysis. And I, I really do um, I, I really do encourage you to actually do sit down and do that with your team. It's a, it's it's worthwhile doing on a regular basis anyway. Um, often they say that that's the, a good measure of a successful business is it knows where it stands in the marketplace alongside its competitors and continually adapt. So the second one is uh, product surround, which we, which we touched upon um, uh, in the last session. And, and as a result of that, I think it, it probably warrants a little bit more investigation. And we, the example we've used here is, is a restaurant business. And the, the product surround, the, the approach effectively is based upon Pareto. And it says that if you are um, delivering a product or a service, there are, there are two effective parts. There's what we call the port core product or service which constitutes 80% of the cost, but only 20% of the value that is actually perceived by the actual customer or client. And then sitting around that is what we call the product surround. Uh, and the product surround uh, may only cost, it may, may only be 20% of the cost of your component parts of actually delivering that product or service. But it, in, in, in the customer's or client's mind, it has 80% of the value. Um, and the reason, the, the, the questions you need to be asking yourself here well, the, 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 first question, um, the first question we're talking about here is, what are the problems and needs for the restaurant during the next 12 months? And so if you, if, if, you, if you think about your own product and service, what are the problems and needs both for the restaurant and also the impact, what do your customers like to have? So within the COVID environment here, we're saying, what are the, what, what are the things that might impact upon a small business? Well, the customers might be a bit nervous about going back. You know, what are we gonna do about social distancing rules? You know, we need to retain key staff such as the chefs and managers. So therefore we need some kind of operation that's going to actually drive the profitability that we had previously to keep that level of expertise. And also you've then possibly got the opportunity of, you know, people that have been driven, people who've been driven indoors and having to cook for themselves, you know, they, they may be tired of that. And there is that, that idea that you want to go back and actually have, you know, have, have a night out or something like that. Um, I must admit, I was, I, was, I was driving locally the other day and uh, wondered what this massive queue was and the local KFC had opened up. It's a sad state of affairs when that is the, uh, that is the draw in the, in the local, in the local uh, region. But the thing is, what, having, having then assessed those problems, what you then say is let's adapt our product and service using the products around to actually um, meet those needs. So in the products around, we might say, okay, if we've, if, we've got, if we've got customers who are nervous about coming back, then we ought to be doing something from a positive point of view in terms of promoting the fact that we've got safe distancing measures. And so therefore you're not gonna be unsafe coming back into our environment. 
social distancing rules. It could be that, that to get the covers, what we're talking about is, is one hour sittings and managing um, customers expectations. We may need to change the menu. So rather than a sort of very long menu and uh, that's going to take a long time for everything to do, we might have a, you know, a refined menu that suits the fact that we need to get stuff out quickly. Social media campaign with well-known local resonances uh, to, to actually get the uh, demand there. Um, customers tired of cooking each night, engaging with online delivery. And there are a lot of reports in the, in the early stages, uh, particularly Deliveroo, uh, spike in demand for people using Deliveroo service was, was, was phenomenal. And so, you know, there has been a need for those businesses that, that may in the past have thought, you know, I don't need an online model. Suddenly through, through reality, they were forced to do so. So that's the idea of the products around. And so it, what, it, what it means is that often it's, it's a way of actually improving your customer centricity. The problem we often have as people within an organization is we look at our product from the inside out rather than from the outside in. So the core for a small restaurant is they've got, they've got kitchens, they've got tables and chairs, you know, they've got a, you know, a till system and stuff like that, and they've got serving staff. But ultimately, what can you do within the products around to actually adapt to the needs or problems of your customer base? And those problems and needs might be evolving. So, and again, you'll have a, uh, you'll have a handout uh, in respect of products around, uh, which is a blank for you to fill in. Um, but any of these, uh, we're happy to pursue uh, with you afterwards if you want to try and use these as opportunities to try and pivot and adapt within your own business. So um, before we go into the next open session, how are we doing for time? We're, we're 10 past one, which is, that's not bad, Martin. We're doing well. Um, th th we, we, we finished this session with, with sort of five further pivot and adapt questions. And uh, I talked last time around about sometimes you don't need to brainstorm, you need to question storm. So I'd suggest that if you're sitting down with your, with your strategic team or, or your other leaders or other managers, these are the five questions that you probably need to have on your agenda. So the first one is what strategies and adaptations will stick and align to the vision post COVID-19? And that's reflecting the fact that some may just be temporary adaptations just to get us through the period of before lockdown really does release. But what we're saying is that which of those adaptations do you actually want to stick? And I'm talking to a lot of people, home working, uh, lack of travel, um, probably are the ones that, that, that are the most popular amongst the clients that I'm talking to at this particular point in time. So, but you've got to ask yourself, you know, if there's a, if there's a particular adaptation we want to stick, what are we going to do about it? Um, what is working? What is not working? Um, we always try and focus on the positive. Often people will say, you know, this isn't working, but if you've got something that's working, you've got to say to yourself, well, why is that working? How is it being received? And can we actually increase um, what we're doing well? Um, to generate more income. Uh, what can we learn from, from other industries? Um, best practice and innovation. Uh, and one of the opportunities for uh, uh, business leader groups is that you do actually meet with other people. And often um, it is just a question of taking a good idea from another industry. I always remember um, a client of mine that, that um, was looking to improve their response time. And so what they did effectively is they, they, they phoned up the local uh, RNLI office and uh, effectively said, you know, we'd like to understand where, where response is critical in terms of life or death, you know, how, what are your systems and processes that you go through to allow you to improve your response time? And so it wasn't their industry, but often you can, you can learn a lot and adapt it to your own place. What can we learn from our best competitors? You know, your competitors are going to be doing stuff. You're not, you're not pivoting and adapting in, in isolation here. You know, your, your competitors, if they're worth their salt, will also be looking. So it is not a, it is not a, a level ground but you need to learn from your competitors and adapt. Um, and then the, the last thing, which I sort of mentioned at the, at the front there is, you know, how does my role either as a leader or a manager uh, within the organization need to adapt for the business as it then continues? So mm -hmm. the question, I suppose the question is, how will you pivot and adapt further? And that's, that's presuming that you have already started to pivot and adapt. I suppose it, it, the feeling if whether, uh, the assumption I'm making is that, that nobody is really left in the survival stage other than, other they've, they've put measures in place and they're now starting to actually uh, uh, look to the future. 
yes, I was I was uh, going to take another one of my buyers here. <laughs> I don't know whether Robert Robert Lee from Wright Hassel still uh, still with us. I, I think I've just unmuted there, Martin. Yeah, good have, yeah, good to hear you, Robert. It's always a real flyer here. We're <laughs> we're forty five minutes into the webinar, and it's has Robert gone off to have a cup of tea, or is he still with us? <laughs> or, or or has Martin broken the technology, which is normal? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> No, I think in fairness, we, we, we've all, we're picking up with some of the comments that have already been made. We, we, at the early stage, were able to successfully transition our business into 300 mini offices so all, all, all at home. Uh, we've been able to carry on providing the support to that. And, uh, and fairly early on again, we, we published those uh, COVID notes, which the Chamber has, has put forward and put out to everybody as well. Um, and, and, and we've concentrated on those. I, I think, I mean, our partners have always been very much engaged on, in, in the business, but we, we've tried to, to adapt to look at for new opportunities within our existing client range and, and the, the various sectors we, we operate in um, to, to see what ones are, are trying to, are, are moving forward. My example was I've got various clients in the restructuring market. Which, which remain active. And we're also beginning to see um, a slight upturn with mergers and acquisitions. The, these are, I would say, the smaller end of, of the deal market. And whilst clients are keen to get offers out there and look at opportunities, um, I think there's a bit of a reticence to, to plow ahead with acquisitions until they can actually go and see, in a sense, touch and feel the, the businesses they, they wish to acquire, which is, is still not possible in the current conditions. It's now the 2nd of June, and uh, certainly this is my first day in the office, or a half day in the office since Friday the 20th of March. Um, I th there's only two people in the office at the moment, but we are, we've got active plans to try and uh, see what we can do to be reopening in um, maybe from the 15th. So uh, we're just playing it by ear at the moment. But yeah, um, evolution and, uh, and working out what the new normal is going to be is going to be a key thing. Working from home will remain the default. And I think the, um, the days of having, uh, well, for us, not 300 people in the building, but 400 sorry, 40 people in the building, they, 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 that may be a very long way off. Oh, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm also cheating at the moment because I'm, I, I happen to be sat in the office. Yeah. Some, 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 some papers still need to be signed. I have to come in yeah. and sign some texts today, <laughs> which, which is rather antiquated. But uh, no, we're, 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 we're looking to offer the employees the opportunity to return to the, the office in uh, early July. So we're just setting the, the office up. But I don't think that, you know, we're also allowing employees to work from home if that's their preference. Um, I'll take another one, one of my flyers now. Um, I don't know whether Lynn Bromley is, uh, is still with us. Lynn has unmuted herself. This, is, this all bodes well. So Lynn, having been a guest on your podcast before, before Christmas, which was great fun, um, I see you've been putting out more episodes over the last few months, but your business as a, as a, as a coach, you obviously work, do a lot of work face-to-face -face with people. How have you had to um, adapt? Yes, absolutely. Hi, Martin. Hi um, yes, it's been um, quite an interesting time. And my background is that I used to manage a virtual team, actually. So uh, I worked in consultancy for, for 20 years or so um, in a, a business that used to do planning software. So all of my team were disparately based. So actually, during this time, I've been developing some content to help people with managing virtual teams. So that's something that I'm just about to to, to start to launch. Um, but you're right, with the podcast, I decided that while I'd got a bit more time available, having had you know some cancellations from those face-to-face -face sessions that I used to do, um, I thought I'd, I'd increase the, the podcast. So rather than doing one a month, I've been doing one a fortnight roughly. Right. So they've been really good fun. Martin can, can, can take this one forward in a couple of slides, but I think the, the key thing is um, and again, this is, this is where we need to put business leader groups within context. It is just one element of how you make things happen within your organization. The whole idea of business leader groups is the outcomes that you get rather than actually sitting down with other people. Um, and so what I often say is that you can either do it yourself, but if you haven't done it yourself already, then how are you going to get involved? The other, the, the other end of the extreme is that you use some very, very expensive consultants that will come in and do it for you. But the middle ground is then you actually do it for yourself, but you do it whilst learning with others and with the sort of steady hand of a coach by your side with access to resources. And so the whole framework of business leader groups is to, we, we always start off with a kick, kick off session, which basically says, okay, what are your top three big issues? And you know, what, what, is the, what is the cost benefit in actually getting those fixed? Or what is, the, what is the cost to your organization? If you don't get them fixed, you know, how are you gonna suffer? And so the key thing there is that having identified the things that you want to change and things you want to achieve within your business, business leader group is merely an element to you, for you to actually use come along 
learn from us, learn from others, but also have the the one-to-one coaching and the the external accountability loop. You need to decide what your top three actions are. Or if you're a MindShop Online user, stick on MindShop Online and I'll follow up on those. If you're not a MindShop Online user and you want to just interact with somebody outside your organization um, as a as a critical friend or as, as someone who's, who will help you catalyze change, then please do send those to me and I will, I will uh, or, or to Martin as well, and uh, we will ensure that we actually help you as part of that process to achieve what you want to do as an organization and, uh, or as an individual. In a couple of slides time, Richard, as we as we come to the close, I'll uh, I'll tell people how they can go about becoming a Daffins Business Leader Group member and um, Brilliant. And, and and how how you can actually start to make a to make a change over the next couple of months. The summary from today, you know, we've had we've we've had fifty five minutes or so. Hopefully you'll be able to learn from shared insights. So that might be insights from you know, just seeing some uh, pieces of paper stuck on a client's wall in terms of how they've reacted to the roadmap and how they're actually thinking about their organization and pivoting and adapting. It might be from the insights of the people that, 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 that have kindly actually uh, opened up their mics and had a chat with us. But the whole idea is that, that you have an opportunity to share with other people. So there are shared insights there. And please do take those away and, and do something about it within your organization. Martin mentioned the uh, the Pivot Adapt online course, which was launched about a couple of weeks ago. So if you're a MindShop Online user, it, it, it's there. You can enroll or we can actually point you towards it. Um, some really good stuff. It, it covers competitor analysis and products around amongst the other modules. We tapped into the, uh, the Survive Pivot Adapt roadmap. I think the key thing there was to say that it needs to be active. You need to make this a process where you're actually doing all the work that is needed so that when actually we get to the point where we can emerge uh, and start generating a level of income again, um, that we are on the front foot, that we're not left for a month, two months, three months or so trying to gear the business up. And then in terms of opportunities for for, for pivoting and adapting, we, we had a brief look through the competitor analysis tool, a uh, quick look at products around, uh, just a couple of tools that we use on a regular basis. And then I, we left you with those five pivot and adapt questions to reflect upon. And I, what I suggest is if you've got any, any, any meetings coming up, just stick those at the top of the agenda um, to just make sure that you at least ask the question even if you don't know what the answers are at this particular point in time. And we'll be sending out a copy of the slides. I think there'll be a recording as well. And uh, um, so those questions will be there for you. You don't have to jot them down. And the last point we mentioned is that, you know, if you've got three strategies specific to you, let us know what they are because we want to be an integral part of actually making things happen within your organization. Right, Martin. Yeah, thanks a lot, Richard. Um, we haven't got any questions that I can see on the Q&A. There's one sitting there, which I think that was... Um, uh, John Wilby's from earlier. So really just to summarize then, um, Richard made the point very well earlier that as businesses are moving through preparing for, uh, for some form of normality, it's going to be a big time of change for a lot of businesses. You can bring in an external consultant who will charge you huge amounts of money to try and fix, help you fix. The way that Daffin's Business Leader Group works is it's a shared approach whereby with Richard or myself acting as your coach and leveraging through the MindShop Online platform um, and a collaboration platform there. This is more, more of a retainer-based um, service where for a fee of £300 a month, and so if you look at it, say £300 a month for the next three months, you could really be making a huge amount of progress in drilling into your business, where it is, where it needs to get to, and, and what it really needs to do to pivot and adapt and thrive as we come out of the coronavirus crisis. All of the courses that Richard's mentioned, the, we talked about the resilience course, the pivot adapt course, and there's 18 other courses that are on there. It's something quite novel from a firm of accountants and the clients that we've got who are working through it are getting a huge amount of benefit from it. So that's the sales part. The, the next of our uh, hour long webinars is going to be in a month's time, just over a month on Tuesday, the 7th of July, the same time, um, 12.30 to 1.30. But I really must stress that these one hour long webinars, and we're all getting a little bit webinared out at the moment, that these one hour webinars, that this is not what Daffin's Business Leader Group is about. The real value is the access to the resources and to Richard and myself as your coaches through the platform, working together to help your business pivot, adapt, and then thrive as we come through the crisis. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Martin. For the second time running, we're within, within, within the hour. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, Thank you again to, the, uh, to, to Ian, Jonathan, Robert, and Lynn, all yes. of whom um, at short notice um, volunteered or were volunteered <laughs> into, into contributing. Thank you very much indeed for that. And um, yeah, you'll be getting a copy of all the slides and the, the resources from today. So unless you've got anything else to add, Richard, I think we will take advantage of the fact that with one minute to go, we are within time. So uh, thank you very much. 
and look forward to seeing you next month.